I'm afraid that by now we've lost all the bright planets from the evening sky. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn have all gone into the twilight. But to compensate for that, we have the brightest of all the planets, Venus, as a magnificent morning object. It rises well before the sun, and if you get up early, you can't possibly mistake it. I had a look at it the other morning with the 15-inch reflector in my own observatory down in Celsi, and I saw the characteristic crescent form. And will you note that the tips of the crescent are rather brighter than the rest of the disk, but I'm going to come back to that later on. And there's one faint shading there, which is diffuse and not very prominent. That was all I could see. And quite frankly, that wasn't my fault, because on Venus, there's very little that you can see. The entire planet's covered with a dense, cloudy atmosphere, and we can't see through it. Which explains the reason why, before the space age, we knew virtually nothing about the surface of Venus. But now, thanks to the American Pioneer probe that's been orbiting the planet ever since the end of 1978, we do have the first really good maps of most of Venus's surface. And we're going to show you those maps this evening. But there's one thing I do want you to bear in mind straight away. These were obtained by radar, so we can't actually see the features in the same way that you can on a Mercury or Mars or, of course, the Moon. But the maps are accurate, they're pretty detailed, and they've provided plenty of surprises. And uh, as always on these occasions, uh, we're delighted to have with us Dr. Gary Hunt. Welcome again, Gary. Hello, Patrick. Well, you've been involved in this program ever since the very start, and I imagine that by now you're pretty pleased with the results. This has been a very successful mission. The orbiter has been operating for something like 18 months, and we've now mapped the entire surface of Venus. Before the mission, with Earth-based telescopes, radars, we have been able to look at just a small number of areas. So now we have the complete picture of the surface of Venus, and lots of surprises which we'll dis discuss. You can even produce a Venus globe by now. Yes, the Venus globe is a rather interesting thing to look at because it gives you an idea of the range of features that we can see. It's color-coded, so you get an idea of different areas. Yellow is the highest region you can see here. Green is a few kilometers below that. Blue is the mean radius of Venus, and the small purple patches are basins a little bit lower. And the fact the altitude range we're looking at here is no more than 13 kilometers. The radar's given wonderful results with Venus, but um, it's by no means a new technique. It's been used on Earth to great advantage after all. Well, I think that's an important point to emphasize mm. because people are saying you're going to a planet like Venus or Mars and you're using radar techniques. How do you know they're giving the right answers? Well, one way of, we have tested this Recently, some results have been carried out where we've used radar in a region of Guatemala. We're using uh, radiation of a wavelength of several kilometers, and so to penetrate all the normal cloud systems, it'll only be attenuated by the surface features. And when we looked at this region, which had been hardly uh, mapped by anybody, we made some important discoveries of some very ancient canals and rivers dating back several thousand years in our civilization. People have now gone out and found precisely that these features are there. So we've now shown that radar is a very valuable way of mapping surface properties without the problems of clouds, because we can penetrate them. It was really the only way of mapping Venus. You know, Gary, I remember doing a sky map program, and it must have been about 1958 or 1959, when we seriously believed that the entire surface of Venus might be covered with water. And that's a far cry from what we know it to be today. Well, indeed. And in fact, I think if we now look at the, at the maps of Venus, we get an indication of the main surface structures. Yes, we have high plateaus. Ishtar Terra, you can see there near the top of the picture. Aphrodite Terra, down to the bottom right. Beta Regio, that's a couple of volcanoes, we'll come to that in a minute. And Maxwell Montes, the mountains of Maxwell, the highest object so far discovered upon Venus, something like 35,000 feet above the mean level of the planet. You can't have sea, sea level on Venus, obviously. No, in fact, this is the problem. We refer everything to the radius of the planet, which is um, 6,050 kilometers. The other thing to point out is all the humps and bumps and speckles you saw in that picture are indeed real. And the radar data that we're discussing refer to sort of squares about 50 kilometers by 25 kilometers. So we average over that region. Anything smaller than that, of course, will be averaged out. We're not seeing very small scale features of meters or kilometers like we have them on Mars. This is our first look in a rather crude way and coarse way of the whole surface of Venus. Well, finer detail lies in the future, but we have at least now got a very good idea of the distribution of heights and hollows upon Venus. Let's have a look at those, shall we? Beginning with the really high areas, and there you can see Ishtar Terra to the top of the picture with the Maxwell Mountains leading off, and Aphrodite down to the lower right. 
Then we have the medium areas. Oh, by the way, that strip of blackness over to the left-hand side of the picture is an area which wasn't mapped in the original charting. It has been done now, I know, and uh, the map has been completed, but there are no special features there. Coming on now to the very lower areas, we can start to see a pattern of height and depth distribution. And I think it may be useful now to put in the names. Here we have Ishtar Terra, and from there we have the mountains of Maxwell. Remember, those are the highest peaks upon Venus. Probably they really are the highest, and this was in this journey. Then we have Beta Regio. Those are the two volcanoes. Aphrodite Regio. And not far from there, we have some of the great rift valleys. So let's look at some of those in rather more detail, Gary, and show some artists' impressions of them. And I think we'll begin, don't you, with the Beta Regio volcanoes. Yes, in fact, what we've done here is the same thing you can do at home with your ordnance survey map. You could take an area and you could draw a section and translate that into a picture. This is what we've done here. And these, we find that the beta volcanoes are in fact two shield volcanoes, very much larger than the Hawaiian chain. The structures we see around it, the slope of the sides, are as realistic as we can uh, interpret from the data. It's rather interesting, Patrick, to remember that the two Russian probes, we know as 9 and 10, landed a little way to the east of this region. Obviously, a good job they didn't land on the top of yes, them. indeed. But the other important thing is that they did, in fact, sample the surface, and we got evidence of basaltic material. This suggests, of course, that it relates back to the volcanoes, perhaps relates back to the active volcanoes and lava flows at some time in the past. Well, I just wonder whether they can be active now. My impression is probably they're not active. Looking at our structure of the surface of Venus as we see it, is that we've probably got one large plate. Now on the Earth, of course, we have six plates, and that plate movement has shaped and sculptured the continents that we know. So it looks like we do not have active tectonic uh, motions on the surface of Venus. The crust is probably quite thick, rather like the, the moon and such like, so we may not indeed have active volcanoes. Well, I agree with that, but it was just, it certainly it's uh, rather too early to be sure. Let's come on now to the plateaus. Now, for much of Venus, is a rolling plain, but we have two major plateaus, Ishtu Terra up there and Aphrodite Terra, very much the same size, and they really are high above the mean planet level. Yes, in fact, Ishtar is a rather exciting thing to look at. Again, we produce an artist's impression. It's about twice the size of the Tibetan plateau, and you can see all the structures there. And to get an idea of the size that we're talking about, we can compare it with the continental United States. And when we superimpose the United States on top of the plateau, you can see that they're almost the same size. And of course, you can also get the slopes. Yes, we can measure the slopes. We've got some idea of that from the mission as well. And on the eastern edge of that, of course, is this mountain called Maxwell. It was the feature we did detect from Arecibo with our Earth-based radar system some years ago. It towers to about 10.8 kilometers above the mean surface of Venus. So far as the highest thing we found, it looks like being the highest feature. And to the east of that as well, there are other small basins as uh, indicated on the surface. Well, Ishtar isn't the only plateau. There's also Aphrodite, which is a comparable in size. And not very far away from there, we have the area of the Great Rift Valleys. And these must be spectacular by any standards. Yes, Aphrodite itself is an interesting plateau. It has a slope on it. It's about 9.5 kilometers on the western edge, sloping down to about 4.5 on the eastern edge. But these rift valleys, again, we've been able to construct an artist's impression to indicate what they look like. Here is an indication. You can see there's quite a lot of structure in the neighborhood of the rift valley. We think it's about two to three kilometers deep. But the interesting thing, Patrick, is that we, of course, have seen rift valleys before. We've seen them on the Earth. We've seen them on Mars. And we get an idea of this feature, which actually is about 2,000 kilometers from north to south, by comparing it with the other features that we've seen in the solar system. Well, let's begin at home and have a look at the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. After all, both you and I have been there, many people have, and uh, when you stand on the edge and photograph a prophet, that's the kind of view that you get, the kind of view with which everyone's familiar, in pictures at least. And look at it from the air, and you can see the river running down inside. And by Earth's standard, it's big, but it's certainly very small when you compare it with the Venus Rift Valley. Yes, this is a, a massive feature by our standards, but if we now take that picture, and draw a section across it, and we can show this again here as an artist's impression. That's what the Grand Canyon looks like. Now, to the same scale, here is what the Venus uh, Rift Valley would look like. You can see it's massive. 
And if we go one stage further, Patrick, and compare it to what we have found on Mars, you can see that the Venus Rift Valley and the Martian Rift Valley are very similar dimensions. Valleys Marineris, the Mariner Valley, discovered by Mariner 9. That's been a long time ago now. And I still think that the Mariner 9 picture of that Martian Valley is about the best ever taken. Yes, when in fact you look now back at the Mariner picture to get an idea of what it looked like in terms of scale. And remember, these small tributaries you can see from the Martian uh, canyon system, we could lose Grand Canyon in the in these side uh, systems very easily. So the feature we're talking about on Venus is massive and must be one of the most important geological discoveries from this mission. Well, Mariner told us a great deal about Mars, and that Venus has volcanoes on it, so has Mars. Let's look at the volcanoes of the fastest ridge upon Mars. They are tremendous structures also. There are, of course, a large number of uh, volcanoes on Mars, but interestingly, you can see to the west of this particular picture several ridges and rills. Whether such features exist on the, on the surface of Venus, of course, we have no idea. We have yet to be able to see down to very small scales. But of course, you can see in that picture small scale features like craters. And of course, we have seen those on other planets as well. When you look at the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, it's amazing how dissimilar they are. Look at Mercury, more like the moon than anything else, but plenty of craters. And this, of course, relates back, as we are just saying, with the craters. We have a totally crater-scarred surface on Mercury. Now, on Venus, so far, we have seen a few craters, but they're very large. They're 50 to 75 kilometers across. Larger features, of course, we will call basins. How they were formed is a matter of great debate. Were they formed by impacts that occurred at a time when the atmosphere was very thin? If they, in fact, is the case, then, of course, what they're saying is the features that shape the surface of Venus are, in fact, happened a very long while ago, so the Venus atmosphere must be a lot younger than the surface features itself. Yes, but even so, it's old by absolute standards, and I would have thought that if those craters were very ancient, they would have been eroded away. I do realize that the surface winds upon Venus are pretty sluggish, but the atmosphere is massive. There must be a great deal of erosion there. Well, we're not seeing very much erosion in some of the pictures taking place in the past, and of course we do not know very much about the behavior of rocks at temperatures as high as we find on the surface of Venus, or pressures like a hundred times the surface pressure of the Earth. It is quite likely we, we could be looking back to features that date back to very early in the history of the planet. Let's come on now to the Venus atmosphere itself. We've got to remember one thing. Venus spins very slowly, 243 Earth days, and it spins a long way east to west. So if you could see the sun from the surface of Venus, which obviously you couldn't, it would appear to rise in the west and set in the east. But the top part of the atmosphere has a rotation period of only four days. And I remember it was way back in the 1950s that the French observers tracked that down by the Y feature. Yes, and in fact we've had a look at the Y feature all the way through the Pioneer mission. In fact, the Pioneer spacecraft has in addition been a weather satellite. This is a picture at ultraviolet wavelengths and you can see the distinct Y feature. If we now follow this sequence of pictures taken one Earth day apart, you will see how the planet rotates firstly from right to left, and furthermore you can see how the clouds move around the equatorial region. They will take four days to come back to the initial starting point, meaning that the cloud particles are moving at speeds like 100 meters per second. But notice also, Patrick, how features tend to spiral down to the poles. The poles clearly play a very important part in the weather systems on Venus. Well, you can see that the poles are bright. You remember that drawing I showed when we started this program, showing Venus as a crescent, which I saw the other night, and I said then that the tips of the crescent were bright. Old-fashioned Venus observers, such as myself, have been looking at these for a great many years, and I think I started observing Venus way back in the, what, 1933, 1934. And although we had no certain knowledge as to where the pole of Venus was, we knew nothing about the axial tilt, we were fairly sure that these bright cusp caps did indicate the polar regions, uh, and I'm delighted to find out that they do. An interesting in indication of just how important the polar regions are on Venus has come from a false color picture that we've made from the infrared instrument on board the orbiting spacecraft. The red and the blue sh show different temperature structures, and the blue collar around the pole is an indication of the fact that we're not looking at clouds, but looking deeper into the atmosphere. It seems there is not much high clouds, and perhaps material is spiraling down. In fact, now when we make a computer simulation using infrared data, you can see how the cloud particles move from the equatorial region up towards the pole, spiral, and then sink 
and link back to the recircling part of the atmospheric circulation. The Venus circulation is quite different from what can be found on the Earth, on Mars, indeed on Jupiter. The weather system on Venus must be very peculiar. You've got this atmospheric shear halfway up too. Yes, and of course the other exciting thing, um, one of the many things we don't really understand, is the presence of lightning. The Russian probes indicated that there was lightning storms taking place near the surface, which many people didn't believe at first. And now it would seem that the Venus atmosphere is highly electrically conducting. Now, normally, of course, we associate lightning storms with tremendous convective activity, yes. with the sort of storm systems we've had affecting our so-called summer this year. Now, also, the, the orbiting spacecraft has picked up uh, electrical signals that suggest that the whole planet through, all the way throughout the atmosphere is also electrically conducting. So perhaps we have a new mechanism creating the lightning storms on Venus. I've often wondered about that, because after all, old-fashioned Venus observers, I say, such as myself, have been for many years observing the ashen light. When you have Venus as a very thin crescent, you can sometimes see the unilluminated hemisphere shining very dimly. I know you get the same thing with the moon, but that, of course, is Earth shine reflected onto the moon's surface from the Earth. And Venus has no satellite. We can be quite certain of that now. So what is the ashen light? Is it sheer illusion or isn't it? I am convinced that it's not, because I was looking at it again earlier on this year when Venus was a very thin crescent, and even when I blocked out the bright crescent by means of an occulting bar, it was still there. And I don't think it's a real, I don't think it's illusion. Precisely what it is in terms of an atmospheric phenomenon is difficult to really speculate at this stage. If it's related to lightning, then it's going to be a very intense piece of uh, activity. Remember, of course, the lightning that we saw on the dark side of Jupiter was very difficult to find and only could be found from the spacecraft. Whether these things are related, that's something for future work. Again, Venus has many problems yet to be solved, and it's not at all the kind of world we believed it to be. After all, consider it. A surface temperature of nearly a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, a dense atmosphere made up chiefly of carbon dioxide, and clouds with a lot of sulfuric acid in them, not the kind of place for a heavy holiday at all. But of course, there are wonderful opportunities in the future to carry out important new missions. Yes, what comes next? Well, in fact, the next big development is going to come from the Russians and the French. They are joining forces on a mission probably in one or two years' time. And one aspect of this will be dropping balloons into the atmosphere of Venus, which will float at different pressure levels. That's a fascinating project, I think. Well, you'll be able to track them. We've done this on the Earth, in fact. Yes. And this is a way, in fact, we can get wind information at different levels in the atmosphere. The four-day circulation that we've been discussing, we'd like to know how that changes with height. Tracking these balloons will be an important way of doing it. But the next important thing, of course, will be the American mission. The next mission launched by NASA will be an opportunity to extend the activities that have been carried out on the Pioneer spacecraft looking at the surface uh, of, of Venus. This will remain the infrared, will it not? No, this again will be, will be a radar mapping yes. mission at very high resolution looking at surface features probably just a few kilometers across. Much higher resolution than we've seen so far, so if there are small scale features, smaller craters, this will be our opportunity of looking for it. This is one mission that we're looking forward to with great excitement for the mid-1980s. I think there's one thing about which we can be fairly certain now. Venus may be almost a twin of the Earth in size and mass, but it's certainly a non-identical twin, and we can fairly safely discount the prospect of any Earth-type life there. I think that's without doubt the case, but the other thing we shouldn't forget you can always get tiny microbes floating around in, in the surface of the, uh, in the tops of the clouds. But I think we should in fact stress at this stage, why are we bothering to, to look at Venus? Is it simply because it's there? We want to know a lot more about the surface, what the surface is like, what shaped it. It relates to the origin of Venus, relates to the origin of the Earth. But also the role that the volcanoes may have played in constructing the atmosphere. Mount St. Helens is putting chlorine into the upper atmosphere of the Earth, probably affecting the ozone layer. Chlorine has certainly been found in the atmosphere of Venus. The role of volcanoes in building up atmospheres and their relationship to climatic change are an important link between Venus and the Earth. Well, we've learned a great deal about Venus. There's still a great deal to be learned in the future, and I think we're going to have many more interesting developments before long. But meanwhile, if you have any kind of a telescope, do go out if you manage to get up early and have a look at Venus now. You will see it as a crescent, and if you watch it over the next few weeks, you will see that crescent gradually thickening till Venus turns into a half and then into a three-quarter shape. It's going to be well on view for most of the rest of the summer. And uh, although it is such a hostile world, it is, 
our nearest planetary neighbour in space, and we're doing our best to find out as much as we possibly can. Gary, I think we're going to have interesting news before long. Thank you again. Thank you. And uh, from Gary and myself, good night. Good night. You can see that program again on Sunday morning at 10.55 on BBC One. And the next edition of The Sky at Night will be on Thursday, the 4th of September. And this BBC book, The Sky at Night, Volume 6.